When you get a hold of a magic object, you don't necessarily know what it is, but its effect is that through your own involvement with it, you find a whole world of people that you never would have found otherwise. You follow the object and you find the people who are also really invested in knowing about it or having it, and it lets you into a whole network of relationships that otherwise you could never know even existed. Would you say the tombstone was a magic object? Oh, for sure, yeah. There we go. The sound is on. We're recording. You look great. Hi. Hi. Um, who are you? I'm your aunt. <laughs> and what's your name? Sonia White. Why do you think, um, if you could look back at me at in my 20s, why do you think I bought the tombstone? I think it was a mystery. Where did it come from? How did it get there? And who even brought it in? You had put the stone on eBay, and then these really mysterious messages came back from people who you had no idea. Just on a whim, I went ahead and pulled up eBay and typed in tombstone. There among all of those listings is this real tombstone, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's in pristine condition. I remember when the sheriff had came back to my desk, and he said he had a case for me to look into that was 70 years old, and I kind of laughed it off. Well, then he brought me actually a phone number to call somebody. And you said, so the tombstone belongs somewhere. What should I do? And it just struck me that the only thing to do was to go and see where it belonged and meet the people who had contacted you out of the blue to let you know that its home was out here. Hi, this is Alexandra Grant calling. I'm good. Is this a good time to catch you? Good. I just wanted to call to check in and uh, tell you that I'm still coming. <laughs> good morning. Let's see. There's no gas in the tank. The car has 12,566 miles on it. It's 924. It's a gray day in Los Angeles. And I am about to leave to go pick up Lena's tombstone and head to Polk, Nebraska. This is the story of Lena Davis's tombstone, how I came to buy it, and its journey home. For the last 11 years, Lena Stone has lived in my studio and brought me intensely good luck. But earlier this year, I realized that Lena Stone needed to go home and I never could have guessed how quickly it came together, the story of where it was from, and how important it was to return it as soon as possible. When I set out from Los Angeles with three video cameras in the tombstone, I had no idea who I'd meet or what kind of magic key to the kingdom the tombstone would turn out to be. I guess you could say it is unusual to go on a road trip with a tombstone, but this was actually the second time I had set out across the country with Lena Davis's stone. The first time was when I bought it, and now I was taking it home. Oh, can you see? There's Lena's tombstone. Right there. It's on the other side of the room, on a divan. But I had to bring it inside last night. I was heading to Colorado Springs to meet Chuck Doremus and his wife, Marion. Chuck is Lena's first cousin and was 10 years old in 1945 when her stone was stolen. He'd been looking for it ever since. I can't reveal exactly where I am, but I just got pulled over by a state trooper 
for going 90 miles an hour. And then he looks and sees the tombstone and he says, now I see that you have a, a gravestone marker here in the front seat. And I told him the story. So he said, give me the citation back and I'm just going to issue you a warning. So of course I asked him to be in the film and he said if, if he weren't in uniform, <laughs> he would be. Hi, Mr. Ramos. I'm good and I'm almost to Colorado. So I'm still in New Mexico, but I'll cross the border in about 20 miles. I just wanted to confirm tomorrow. Comparing this to the last time that I drove Lena in the car, I didn't know why I was doing that. And I mean, I still think it's an incredibly magical object. I mean, it can stop speeding tickets in New Mexico, right? Let's just be honest about that. There is a tombstone swaddled like a baby. I'm just packing everything up. I was nervous about meeting Marion and Chuck because I knew that I'd never be able to see the stone the same way again. I was a little bit early, so I was sitting in my car and I didn't expect um, them to find me in the parking lot, but they did, and it was just this amazing, there she is, there they are. I said something about the stone having this incredible energy, and Chuck said that he, he knows. You know, when we opened the box in the back of the trunk, he said, I put my hand out and I touched it. So there's something about the stone that's very loaded with energy. I am about to embark on the final part of this trip, leaving today for Nebraska. Chuck explained to me yesterday that he saw the cemetery as a museum, and that really spoke to me. And the idea that I am returning a stolen artifact to a museum of, of history, it's just very exciting. It went from sort of an incredible sacred object to, for me to something very, very specific. And the thing is, is that the tombstone is all those things, which is what makes it a magical stone, really. Between Chuck and his father, their two generations span over 140 years. His father knew Lena and told Chuck about her when he was a boy. Hi, Sheriff. I just wanted to let you know that I'm in Nebraska and planning on being at your office tomorrow at 10 ish, and I'll see you tomorrow. Arriving in Grand Island, Nebraska. There's this incredible pink sunset over here. And just about every brand name something over everywhere else. But this is sky, you can't even believe the sky, it's so crazy. Here's the hotel. The last night that I will ever get to spend with Lena's tombstone. Um, I have it in the hotel room for safety, as I have every night on this trip, um, because the last thing on earth, honestly, I need is to have it be stolen from the car. So this is a first for a California car. Completely frozen. Look at the car. The sheriff did say 10-ish, which I'm stretching to 10-30-ish. Anyway, I have to confess to having some anticipation about all this. Ah! Alright, I see, I see signs of town up ahead. Aha, there we go. Here it is, Polk County Sheriff's Office. How's everyone this morning? Oh, it's okay. This is a typical day in Osceola. <laughs> you know, this morning there was frost on my car and I was like, what's that? Yeah. How do I get it off? <laughs> and I was like, okay. Is a CD California and take it next, you know. <laughs> yeah, a CD. Let's see. Credit card Mine's, works. My yeah. credit card? Oh my god. CD, you guys. credit cards, CD holders. We have ice scrapers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> It does, it looks like it. 
I know. I well, I wanted to have something white because obviously it's oh how sweet. Now the first thing I said to you on the phone was, if it was stolen in 1945, I just need to be clear that I'm 38 years old. <laughs> so you know, clear the record. I want Julie to be in the picture too, because she really. I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard the whole story. Get your right. donuts in the picture. I know. I'm about to, we can put it down. Put it back. All right. I know. Well, I was just, this, what's the best way to transport a tombstone? I had it, I have to tell you one story you're going to crack up at. I'm not going to say what state it is, but turns out I have a little bit of a lead foot. So crossing some state. I had the tombstone in the front seat of the car, and uh, a state patrolman pulls me over, cites me for speeding, writes me a ticket, and then says, oh, excuse me, madam, is that a gravestone marker in your car? <laughs> I said yes, and I told him the story of where I was going, and he said, will you give me that ticket back, and he crossed out, he crossed out the car. So, I have to watch out now, what, what's going to keep me out of trouble? Is what well, you know, have a, you get out of jail free car. On your car. <laughs> I've never used it before. Put the cruise on the speed limit, don't put the cruise on 88. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you are, in, you are in possession of stolen property. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a felony, because you want it over... Five hundred dollars for it on eBay, <laughs> which makes it a felony. So you are. Are you serious? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for driving up here. We didn't have to extradite you back. You saved us a bunch of money from going out and getting you. Are you serious? serious. Over five hundred dollars in your possession of it. We'll talk. But you said you had it for ten years. What did you? Where did you put it at? In your house, or what did you do with it? Awesome question. We're all thinking that same thing. Where do you put a tombstone? What, what person buys a tombstone? Um, I had it at home, and then I have to admit, it was a little bit intense to have in the house. So I am a painter by profession. I have a studio, and it's lived in my studio. You know, when I moved studios, I, I, this thought went through my head that it needed to go home, and I didn't know where that was. And so my idea was, I'll put it on eBay for a lot of money, so only someone serious would contact me. That was the only idea I had to put it into the world. I wasn't going to write free tombstone yeah. <laughs> for the right museum. You know, like, I didn't know how to do that. And so the timing just was so coincidental that Julie read an article about another tombstone the day before. The whole thing began because we got a gift from our school system that we were getting the newspaper for the first time. And it was the Grand Island Independent. And it arrived, uh, the first one arrived November 1st, and I opened it up, and the bottom front page was an article about a man from Tennessee who had bought a tombstone at a garage sale and wanted to find out where it belonged. And had done all the genealogy work and had traced it back to Dan and Brock, which was just about 45 minutes from our house, and had had it replaced. I thought, gosh, do people really sell tombstones at garage sales and of course how would you know which garage sale to go to find one not that I was really interested in buying one but it was just the concept was so foreign and I thought eBay is probably the more specific place to look for something like that and I've spent a lot of time with genealogy and graveyards and I'm used to 1880 tombstones being so faint you can barely even make out the names on them and the dates but this was so clear and I scanned down it, and it just, you know, I saw bought Wyoming. I'm going to just do some searching. And then I decided maybe if she's on somebody's family tree in on the Internet, and up comes the, the link for the Polk County Pleasant Home Cemetery. And so then I pull up the map, you know, and look, and go, oh my gosh, that's an hour and a half from my front door. How in the world did this thing get from Polk County to Wyoming, and then, you know, went back to eBay. The seller's in California. <laughs> this is so bizarre. This is the felon giving this back to the police. <laughs> I should have some sort of, like, strengths on or something. <laughs> you want handcuffs? No. No. <laughs> Pretty good publicity before the election. <laughs> Wait, you run for this office? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, this isn't a this isn't a give me position here. here this is gonna be our amazing shot. <laughs> so the stolen you were really pulling my leg though about the 
you really could be charged with possession of stolen property. I really could you be. are in possession of stolen property, right? I am. And you want to talk to your attorney for answering these questions. And you asked more than $500 for it, correct? You yeah. asked $750? Yeah. Felony's $500. So, but so there's paperwork possession. I get to sign, right? Oh, come on. See how, see how the rest of the day goes. You need to get abortion cars. <laughs> oh, terrible. Have you seen mine? So have you washed my car? That would be a little bit of a... <laughs> Are you sure this is the way? There's no, no sign. I'm not. Okay. Woo! Could be worse. We could be in the dark. Though. That's true. Look at this. This is the road. We think. We we're think. Going down the right place. So I am driving in a police car, trying to find the location of the cemetery. It's somewhere here. There's a, we're at an intersection of gravel roads. And it turns out that nobody knows where the cemetery is. And I did have some directions, Brian, Fort, Bible, County, 10, but I left them in, uh, <laughs> I left them in the sheriff's office. How about right there? Does that look like a cemetery? It is a cemetery. Where are you pointing? Oh, you see the tombstone marker, see the grave that's nice Oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. That is a good thing. There it is, my dear. This is what you came to see. This is, I, I've come all the way from Los Angeles. To drive out in the country. This is amazing. Pleasant Look at Hall that. Cemetery. That is amazing. What a beautiful part to have, a, part of the world to have a cemetery. This is incredible. Here we are. Okay, from the south fence, is that what that's saying? Yeah, 71 feet from the south fence. So, Julie, yes. how is this going? It's wonderful. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> it's so cool to be here and know that she's here. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Yeah. And can you believe we have this whole amazing group of people? So are you going to uh, go through the whole thing with channels 10 and 11 again? Yes. Okay. I'm here for whatever you need yeah. me, as long as well, I Well, because it'll make TV. And oh, good. It'll be great. Yes, I'm planning on it. You know. Um, Julie, can you stay for the TV? I think so. Okay. I can't talk. But That's okay. I can stay. <laughs> What's this? Oh. Look, these look exactly. Oh, that's incredible. They were out of Colorado when they brought their So it would have to be. These are his. Her parents. Dad is going to be I think this is it. I can't imagine 66 years ago what this place would have looked like and why you come off the beaten path to this location. What a hard life. Yeah. <sighs> they buried so many. Wow. And yet they were all going through the same thing at the same time. Yeah. And so, you know, those, that's the family here. But the one over there was probably you know, going through the same thing at the same time, and they held each other up. Yeah, amazing. That's that community concept that you can see. Yeah. From one stone to the other. Yeah. A small cemetery. I was feeling really bad. I definitely put you on the spot out here. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. I turned you in. <laughs> you turned me in. It's going to be a while before I forgive you for that one. <laughs> I mean, what a cool place for a cemetery. Right? You know, we were all sitting back there at the actual site of where Lena came from, and I don't think there was one of us there that wasn't wondering, was it day or night when they were, you know, 66 years ago when they were out here and they took this, why did they take that particular stone? Do you agree that you think there's somebody out there that remembers as a brother's uncle's cousin or yeah. an aunt yeah. that remembers, say, I remember when that was told. I just, I just want to make sure it could be Lady Thief. It could you want to get equal opportunity for badness. Was your family around the area at the time? <laughs> you're putting more suspicion than doubt on yourself. <laughs> well, I should read your rights some point. I keep you really being so. A gravestone stolen more than 60 years ago finally returns home after traveling across the country. Our top story tonight, a cold case in Polk County is cracked. Good evening, I'm John Borden. 
And I'm Vanessa Flowers. A woman bought a gravestone more than a decade ago, never knowing it was stolen property. Now that woman has traveled halfway across the country to return that gravestone to its rightful place. Once I learned that it was an actual marker, that there was an actual home for it, it it changed the meaning of the object from being, you know, something very special for me and, uh, you know, a work of art to being something very personal for a whole group of people. The tombstone reads the name Lena Davis, a little girl who died when she was only eight months old back in 1880. When the stone is missing, the story is quiet. And that story will be able to be told again once that stone is back in place. When the ground is soft and we can set the stone back in the cemetery, hopefully with about six feet of cement so no one will try to steal it again. In Polk County, Katherine Crane, 1011 News. I want to give a shout out to the Sheriff's Department in Polk County, Nebraska for encouraging me to use the thing in the car that you said and it goes a constant speed. This way I will not go faster than 85 miles an hour and hopefully uh, that will keep me out of harm's way. I'm off to capture one more part of the story in Buffalo, Wyoming, where I first connected with the stone. Thanksgiving. Where are you at now? I'm just out of Sioux City. I'm heading up, up. I'm driving over to Buffalo. I talked to Dawn at the Ho Occidental Hotel, and she said the weather's going to be great this weekend. Buffalo, Wyoming uh, was my home before I moved here, and my niece came to visit me, and uh, we went shopping together and went all around Buffalo because it's very, it's a very quaint town, very historical, and um, a lot of antique places. I remember you took me down to meet Chet and see the store because it was just such a neat place. Yes. Well, I wanted you to see all of Buffalo, and that was one of the... The real highlights yes. of, of, of where to shop and find unusual things. Well, you went back to the house with me, and we were discussing different things in the, in the store. Yeah. And uh, you brought up that you were really interested in the tombstone. But you decided you really wanted it. And I thought, okay, <laughs> I was looking at jewelry and you were looking at tombstones. So I, you know, it was kind of different. It's interesting traveling these roads, thinking about being out here in 1880, what life must have been like. I mean, even in 1945, what life was like out here. And how did that stone get this whole distance? That's the big mystery. So I have just arrived in Buffalo, Wyoming. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Um, I'm staying at the Occidental Hotel, which is amazing. And I have to talk about the fact that I chose this hotel room over another because the other one I looked at was haunted. Seriously. <laughs> Hi, is this Judy? Judy, this is Alexandra Grant, Sonia's niece. How are you? I, um, I'm in Buffalo. I just got in last night and wanted to set up a time to come see you and Chet. I'm on my way to meet um, Chet and Judy Motless, who owned the rendezvous back in the day in uh, 2000. You were going to tell a story about a cow, a cowbell. A cowbell, yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let me get those two I used to tell stories all the time to people who came in. People who buy antiques want a story yeah. to go along with it, you know? Yeah. So this couple came in and uh, they said that uh, they were in, interested in this cowbell. I said, that's fine. It came from Nebraska. She said, really? I said, yeah. It belonged to an ad on a, three, a three-legged cow. <laughs> she said, what? I said, yeah, because 
the reason they put the galvel on was because he kept wandering across the road and kept getting hit and lost a leg. So I had to, so I had, a, I had a three, <laughs> three legged cow in Nebraska. And they bought the, the, when they bought it, they said, we're not buying a cowboy because it's a cowboy, we're buying it because it's a story. I said, fantastic. <laughs> and I think I told you the story about the, the tombstone too, didn't I? Yeah. Well, the, the story I remember is, is it was right. from a ranch that had been, um, they turned it into like a development or something. I don't think it was a development. I think uh, it was a ranch that was sold to the kids and the kids around here, no, no, don't, don't keep the ranches, they just sell them. Right. And, they don't want a ranch anymore. Right. And uh, it was taken off a ranch around here. But then I talked to Dave after that, and Dave said, no, it's not what happened. He says, I bought it at an auction. I said, really? He said, yeah. But was it unusual to have a tombstone in the store? Yes, it was the only one I ever had. The only, one, only tombstone I ever had in the store. Yeah. And it was right up front, too. It was right in, in their section. Yeah. Right across the counter. Yeah, I'll never forget that, exactly yeah. where it was. Yeah. You know, you cared about the object, I cared about it, and so it's it's just interesting for me to follow through all the way on it, so. Aww. I'm glad you did. Yes. Made my day. <laughs> it was pretty incredible um, to, <laughs> just quite a storyteller, and uh, he was so funny, he said, as I left, well, thanks for bringing one of my stories back to me. So I think he just he got a lot of pleasure um, out of working at the rendezvous and uh, and selling all these items. I mean, every every item has a story, and why it ends up at an antique store, you know, the amount of stories that pass through his shop and through his hands. Um, but that was very cool. Here's the little town of Buffalo. I'm on my way to meet Dave Osmondson at his forge. Dave was the last known owner of the tombstone who consigned it with Chet at the rendezvous. That store up on the right with the green awning is the sports lure. That's where the rendezvous used to be. From what I remember, it was purchased at a local auction. And the story that went with it was that it was something about it being exposed along a creek bank or ditch or something. Is mm -hmm. it the water had kind of eroded the side and unearthed this gravestone. But I was looking at it as a piece of folk art, a piece of history. Right. Um, and a very interesting, very unique piece. I guess you could look at it as your last possession in life is your gravestone. Right. I think I was kind of surprised that somebody bought it. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> It made me feel that weird that day when Chet was trying to sell it to me, and I said no. And I remember coming back and telling John, I said, you know, there's this tombstone down at Chet and Judy's shop, and Chet really wants me to buy it, but I'm just feeling so strange about this child. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, this is a child. You yeah, know? you know, it's so funny, because I had, with the tombstone, that sense, it wasn't a voice or anything, it was just like, compelled. Mm -hmm. I felt this like utter, like it was drawing me to it. Mm -hmm. And then I tried living with it at home and it, it didn't really want to live at home with me. It wanted to live where I worked. In the studio. Yeah. And when I just, I just moved studios, which is the whole reason that I thought, and I just had this clear voice in my head, it's time for the tombstone to go home. Mm -hmm. And then when I put it on eBay, I, the, it, the number came into my head because I was like, oh, I'll put it at this price. Nope. So I want to talk for a second about the squeaks. When I got here, I went upstairs, mm -hmm. and you gave me two rooms to choose from. Mm -hmm. And I went into that number 32, mm -hmm. and immediately knew there was something there. And I came back downstairs, and you were so You said, I thought for sure you'd take 32. I was like, oh no, I felt something. <laughs> well, I never know, you know, who, you know who will pick up on things. I'm leaving Buffalo, Wyoming, and I do have to say, when I went upstairs that last time in the hotel, there was definitely a ghost there, just standing at the stairwell. There is no doubt in my hair. Whoa. So the last time I drove this road, this is Highway 25, and I'm going to head down to Casper and then cut over. 
but I, this is the road that goes down to Denver. Uh, I drove it in 2000 with the tombstone sitting next to me in the front seat. And I do wonder what I was thinking about. You know, the tombstone and I were part of a journey to get me home. really interesting and that's where I'm headed now back to LA so do you talk to the tombstone room? do you know what's interesting is that uh, when I stopped at your place because it was a very weird thing to do I mean, when I think, because I was just back in Buffalo and talking to the other people who'd seen it in the store and everyone right. remembered where it was and why they didn't buy it. And I just remember going in on the third trip, I was like, this thing is so compelling. Like, it just has this, it's so sad and it's here and why is it here? And it has, it had mystery and I just didn't have the words for it. Right. But it also had this, um, you know, the sense of like just being so sad and it needed and it, you know, it just was like, it was a baby, it was a child. And I remember I took it into your apartment and then I went to a hotel, I remember in Kansas, and I took it into the room and put it in the second <laughs> double bed. And I, I, I did for a period refer to the tombstone as a she, like she this, she, right. because it had this incredible presence and that's why I didn't have it at home. And I had it in the studio because it definitely had, a, every time you saw it, how it makes you think of right, right. who this person was or baby was. So was it the first piece of artwork that you collected? Oh yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. I, I thought I remember reading that. It's what we're thinking at the time. I'm like, so this is part, <laughs> interesting part of an art collection. And back in the, you know back in the day, like, that was like 150 dollars. Like that was kind of a lot of money. <laughs> but I just remember being like, wow, one tombstone collecting as art, collected as artwork, two spending 150 dollars. Like, so much money at the time. It was at the, the time, time like money. to us, like that was that was a significant. Good. I'm glad you money. said that because someone I told someone that I paid that, and they were like, "That's not very much." And I'm like, at the time, it was a. At the time, we had no, we didn't have two dimes to rub together. I know. And it was like, wow. Okay, Alex is really into this tombstone, and okay, it's kind of creepy that <laughs> it's going to be in our apartment, but that's fine. But you clearly like felt strongly about it. I mean, it wasn't just like packed up in the trunk of your car. You know, in the front seat, buckled in, <laughs> you brought it in. It was like, it was a big deal. I'm just getting on to the highway, Highway 15, leaving Salt Lake City, beautiful mountains. About to make the last push home to Los Angeles via Las Vegas, and I should be home tonight. Returning home, I realized that it doesn't matter if we ever solve the mystery of who stole the stone or how it got from Polk, Nebraska to Buffalo, Wyoming, and the story is still unfolding. I was gone for over 10 days and according to the odometer drove 3,903 miles. I'm so happy to be home. this idea about um, a family site for everyone to be in. For everybody to have a place, yeah. right, where they all end up in one place and because everybody travels. Everybody's all over the world half the time and, and you never know where everybody's going to end up. That was for the only reason that I bought the plots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember I was 20 something. You were 25 and you were upset. I was 25. I didn't even have a place to live of my own in, in, right. in my living life. In my living life. <laughs> and then you gave me you gave me a cemetery plot. You knew where I was gonna be after I lived, but right. not during. Right. You were the only one that had a problem with me giving you this great plot as a gift. You you said, Aunt Sonia. What a terrible thing to give for a gift for for Christmas. I says, well, it's just that I want you to have something so that I know where you're at in the end. So here we are in the graveyard. I know half of these people right here because a lot of them are veterans mm -hmm. and family friends that I've met over the years too. This is the view from my grave 
plot in Plains, Montana. This is where the folks wanted to be because of the way that, you know, the pass is right there. It's just perfect. And my mother just loved this, this, I mean, of all the places, loved the cemetery to see that beautiful pass, you know. I think you fit. Yeah, she does fit. You fit, it's great, so, okay. Taking care of Lena Stone helped me understand how important cemeteries are in terms of family histories and stories. I haven't thanked you yet for buying me the cemetery plot, so I'm gonna take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you for this beautiful place. You're welcome, but you may have to leave me here because I might not be able to get off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to push recording. You won't even notice. There we go. I can't think of a more fitting interview because you're the person who can help contextualize the whole idea of sort of returning an artifact to its community of origin and in a much larger scope than, than just sort of me, an artist in Los Angeles and a small community. In, right. In but it's the, same, it's the same issues that we deal with here at the museum. Uh, I research the history of ownership uh, or provenance of the objects that are in the collection and I also research the history of ownership of the objects that we're considering acquiring. So I look at where the objects have been and try to ensure that we are not accessioning or acquiring works of art that have been stolen. And when you come into a museum, you look at the paintings on the wall or the sculptures and you pay attention to the artist, you pay attention to the style, the subject matter. It's very rare that you come into a gallery in an art museum and you really think about the sort of life story of that work of art. There is very often a broader context in which we can see how these objects got here, where they've been and what they signify. So I would say it's particularly true um, when there is that human connection and when the story of a work of art is really tied to the story of, of a human being. When the story of where something is from gets lost, a greater story is lost. And I'm wondering if you've had experiences like that at the museum. Well, certainly, and in particular because a lot of the work that I've done has been on works of art that changed hands during the Nazi period. And I'm reminded of um, an embroidery that we had in our collection for 70 years, and we learned in 2000 and Eight, I believe, that uh, it had once belonged to a small museum in Trent, Italy. And that while we never knew what the subject matter of this embroidery was, it actually represented the burial of the patron saint of Trent. And it came from a series of embroideries that depicted the patron saint's life. And we deaccessioned it and returned it. Um, I then had the opportunity to travel to Trent. The museum had restored the embroidery and they had reunited it with the whole narrative series, and there was a special exhibition dedicated to this series of embroideries that they would not have been able to put together since the 1930s. So they used the return of this embroidery as a springboard for discussion, not just about the series of tapestries, but also about restitution issues. And you realize that this gesture on the part of the MFA to return something that didn't belong to us uh, has this tremendous impact in a small city in Trent. Um, and we were able to forge this really wonderful relationship with them. And so in that sense, it's not exactly analogous to taking care of a cemetery, but you do get a sense of the sort of greater good and the greater context in which these things can be seen. And we are, are all a part of the museum community and the art world. Um, so it, it, it is important to maintain um, these relationships to be responsible um, and, and cultivate this greater sense of responsibility, I think. When I returned to Nebraska in 2012, I was invited by the Doremus family in the Polk County Historical Society to be part of a celebration to rededicate Lena Stone in the Pleasant Home Cemetery. My family decided to join me, my brothers Olaf and Finn and sister Florence, and help with the filming, but really to have our own family reunion too. The first stop we made was to see the stone put back in the ground. And there was Lena Davis's stone, where it was supposed to be, next to her parents, Greeley and Mary Louisa Davis. We are in the Polk County 
Historical Society. <laughs> this is our sod house. It is a visual of what it used to be like. Do you think it's possible that Lena Davis was born in a house like this one? It's very possible because in this time period there was very little wood or trees out in this part of the country. So they had to use what they had. They either dug a cave into the side of the of a hill, otherwise they used the dirt, the sod, and built the sod house. They were for short periods, and so it would deteriorate quickly, and that's why you don't see any, if you drive around the country, you do not see any sod houses. You may find some old log cabins around, but you don't see uh, sod houses. I drove out here to Polk County knowing very little about mm -hmm. Nebraska and very little about the pioneer culture here. Just knowing that I had this almost sacred mission to mm -hmm. return the tombstone. Can you tell me what your thoughts were that morning? <laughs> well, I had a hair appointment to get my hair cut at 10 o'clock. And about 9 o'clock the phone rang and it was the president of our society. Well, he said, they're bringing a tombstone back. The, Mm -hmm. what originated somewhere around here. He said, didn't know all the details, but he said, if you aren't busy, could you go up to the sheriff's office? I said, I'd be glad to. Forgot all about my hair appointment. <laughs> I was really amazed and I was impressed that some person who had no connection with any of this would take the care of that stone and show the reverence for it that you did. That just blew me away. Thank you. Because I thought this lady who has no reason to do this, she could have just sold that on eBay, done anything with it. You didn't do that. You brought it back where it belonged. Absolutely. And we love you for it. <laughs> so there seems to me to be a real sense of Polk County history that people really care about. Now, how, when did your family come to this area? My great-great-grandfather and his daughter came here in 1868, and now I'm the fifth generation to live here in oh, Polk wow. County. Yeah. Wow, that's so, amazing. Yeah. My uh, family is owned property in Polk County for 106 years. The sheriff and I do coffee routinely in the, in the mornings with the, uh, the older farmers of the community and it's fun to listen to them talk about back when they were kids how there was no trees and everything was flat and you know they had the grasshoppers up here that destroyed all the crops and they had the uh, the dust bowl and the clouds of dust would come, the locusts, uh, you know, no water, no crops and to think that they've survived to look what we have now. I think people were overwhelmed that something 67 years later had been found. So this was a good news day, bringing the tombstone home. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Doesn't This kind of thing doesn't happen all the time uh, around this, here? Th <laughs> this don't happen every day of the week. I don't think you ever see it happen again in Polk County, Nebraska, to tell you the truth. I can be honest. It's with a you. pretty unusual story, huh? It's very unusual because, you know, I mean, it's probably the oldest crime that's ever been solved in Polk County. Mm -hmm. it, this is really a, a big deal for Polk County, Nebraska. And, uh, you know, it's been talked about ever since you were out here the first time. Um, <laughs> right. back there a little All bit. right, so what do we do? Here oh, we go. Come on. Come on back. <laughs> Put that on, then I'll cuff you, and then okay, they can get good. you. This is part of the, this is what did not happen. I could get in a lot of trouble in the next few days. I can arrange for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I already been in the back. We've already put the, we put the handcuffs on. You missed it. <laughs> that could happen again Saturday. No, it's okay. Is there anything else that you can think of that you just want to put in the record for this project? Be yourself Saturday. Okay. Just don't change anything about you the way you are. You've always been like you are right now. Don't change that. Okay. Be just how you've been the past year. That's all I ask. I guess I didn't expect what he was going to say to be so personal. Yeah. Like he was speaking in a very personal way to you. Yeah. That I thought was, I was surprised by that. Like he obviously really thinks that the project has a lot to do with like your character as a person. Like he talked a lot about this idea of integrity. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, when he was talking to you and also when he was talking about the people from here. Um, and it's obviously... Are talking about my double chin? <laughs> no, he's talking about mine. <laughs> oh, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> Um, 
it's obviously a quality in people that he really values. And so for him to use that word like twice, twice about his people and then yeah. also about you, I thought, fun. right, exactly. You're actually secretly from here. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought so. Story is, is just fantastic, and what a blessing that <laughs> that this tombstone is back here. And, uh, yeah. 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 Well, I was determined. I know. You tell John. He'd say, "Well, I don't think we can go back." I said, well, "Yes, we are." No. So this is the extraordinary thing that Chuck is the first cousin of wow. David. Wow. I know. It's hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's amazing. It's amazing we're here. Yes, it is. I'm so glad you all could come. Isn't it funny? Yeah. So are we. <laughs> Good. I'm still in disbelief myself that so many people, uh, it, would, it touched that many people mm -hmm. enough that they would come mm -hmm. and be there with us. My people. Or with you, it's hard to forget them. I know, we came to see the stone already in the ground, and it's so moving. We came on Thursday, just to, right. and I tested it. I have to I confess, I, I checked, I made sure that no one could pull it out of the ground. Oh, no, well, that's just, you know. Yeah, we don't want this one stolen. No, no. You might end up with it again. <laughs> so Pat just gave me this list in order of speaking, and I am before Bob, so it means that he's going to have the last word. So I'm a little bit nervous about it. Well, things are supposed to happen for a reason, and maybe that's why something like this happens, huh? I think so, <laughs> to bring us all together. Right. I'm totally convinced. On behalf of the Polk County Historical Society, I want to welcome all of you to the Pleasant Home Cemetery. <laughs> On a cold day last November, I got a phone call from Charles Noyd, the president of our group. He told me that a lady from California was bringing back a tombstone and she'd be up at the sheriff's office. Could I just go up there and see what was going on? So I did, and from there the story unfolded. And that's why we are here today. She brought Lena Davis's tombstone back here to be reset on her grave. At this time, I'm very proud to introduce Alexander Grant she has brought the stone from California. We welcome her to Nebraska, and she will give us, a, say, a few words at this time. Thank you, Pat, and thank you. I might start crying. <laughs> we have shed a few tears over this. I can't, um, can I go after, can I go later? Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's so emotional for you Julie, all to be here. Julie, would you be able to share now? Why don't you come up here? And Bob, why don't you come up here too? And maybe all three of We're you. We're going to start weeping. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I have to do to go after Bob, actually. He was really nervous about going after me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth what really happened. Um, November 2nd of last year, the sheriff came into my office and said, I got an assignment for you. We have a gravestone that's been recovered in California. Okay, I'm not too sure I follow this. When was it stolen? He said about 70 years ago. I said, where's the file for that at? He said, I don't think there is a file for that. So through the Dreamuses and, and Julie doing a lot of my work for me, I came up with a plan with the sheriff that I was going to get on the internet and talk to the person who was selling the tombstone, and I was going to trick them. I was going to tell them that I was a hillbilly from Nebraska and I was interested in this gravestone and I had a brother that lived in LA that was going to come out and look at it. So I had emailed the person who had this headstone and y'all know how the internet goes? Nothing ever goes like it's planned to. Well, about 45 minutes later, I had a call. I didn't recognize the number and I'm thinking, who could this be? It was Miss Grant. 
my story was going out the window because I said, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm the police, and you have stolen property. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you know, we have to do extradition in the state of Nebraska. If somebody has stolen property in another, in another state, our governors have to get together and sign papers so we can extradite her back here with the stolen property. <laughs> well, we tricked her. Obviously, because she's here as well as the stone. <laughs> I'm glad of all people in the world that had that stone that Miss Grant had it because I think if it had not been for the kind of person that Miss Grant is, we would never be here today. <laughs> From the Polk County Sheriff's Office standpoint, this has been an overwhelming and exciting case for us to work. Uh, in my 27 years, this is the only case of this caliber I've worked. And uh, again, if it wouldn't be for, for Miss Grant, we wouldn't be here today. So I thank her for her high integrity and, and for being the kind of person she is. Thank you. give it another go <laughs> okay this is the second attempt clearly this is an incredibly emotional moment for me so just last year I got very clear messages that said it's time to find a real home for this stone I never imagined this I and mean, this is such a dream when I first met with you Chuck you gave me such purpose because in a way I have to admit I didn't know why I was doing this <laughs> And I sat with you in the Village Inn in Colorado Springs, and you said it would be important that people care about this cemetery as I have cared for it. I'm so grateful to you all for being here today. It's been a, a real adventure. Um, I've been able to take a little more time and learn a little bit more about Lena. We don't know very much, but I'll tell you what we do know. Lena most likely died of diphtheria or scarlet fever. There, that was the diseases that were taking children at a very high rate in Nebraska that year. At her death, Lena's father was only 26 years old and her mother was only 19. She had a three-year-old brother and a two-year-old sister and her mother was pregnant and due in April. Uh, the small community that she lived in was populated with uh, grand both sets of grandparents as well as all of her aunts and uncles. Her grandfather, C.S. Davis, was the first settler and the first postmaster of Pleasant Home Township. And he and her maternal grandfather, uh, Christopher Doremus, were both members of the first school board. Lena's maternal and paternal families um, had both been in the United States for over 100 years by 1880. Uh, she was a child of, of the United States and a child of Pleasant Home and a child of Nebraska. Every cemetery stone uh, in this and every other cemetery in our country holds the potential for that kind of story. Often heartbreaking, but more often inspiring. Um, oftentimes those tombstones are the only tangible evidence that a life was ever lived, especially one as short as Lena's. Those stones and the stories that they tell are part of our nature's treasure. Our nation has that heritage that we need to protect. And that's the responsibility of, of every community to protect those stones. Thank you, Julie. And Bob and Alexandra, thank you. Um, I'd like to have everybody who's part of the Doremus family, please raise your hand. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Almighty God, you have reminded us today that there is no life so insignificant that you cannot bring meaning into it and touch lives generations later. Somehow in your mysterious majesty you have worked in the heart of Alexandria, in the heart of Julie, in the heart of Bob, in the heart of the historical society members, in the hearts and prayers of the Doremus family who for all these years have waited for this joyous reunion of stone to grave. <laughs> when I walk into the cemetery, Chuck has talked about it as being a museum. And I can understand that point of view because it's a historical record. You know, it's just little pictures of history there. But for me, it's more like a library because every single one of those stones represents a story and a life story. You start building a picture in your mind of that person and you know the time period and if it was an epidemic as we suspect it was with with Lena that it was probably diphtheria and you know that that was happening to every single family there wasn't a family that was untouched 
and it became a shared experience, a shared loss. Um, but also, you know, that shared history and that shared identity of we survived. And that shapes not only who they are as individuals, but who they are as a community. This touched the community here, is what it did. I mean, it, it, it uh, even though it, it's one stone in one cemetery, mm -hmm. the Poe County people could relate to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, I'm glad you were the person that ended up with this because had it not been someone with your integrity, this would have never, we'd never be here today. Mm -hmm. It'd still be the, the Davises would always be wondering where it's, where it's at. Because yeah. it does put closure to family. I realize that, you know, the child's been deceased for a long time, but still a headstone, that's a representation of that person. The last morning in Nebraska, and it's totally fitting that we're leaving as the sun is rising in this really beautiful place. And I leave wondering when we're going to come back. <laughs> what will the next visit to <laughs> Polk County be? In 2013, the Polk County Historical Society invited me back to be their first artist in residence. I decided to make a book. Florence helped adapt a short story written by Pat Larson's grandmother called Grasshoppers. We illustrated it with all the fifth graders in the whole county and our friends, including Julie and her family. In 2014, we celebrated with the publication of the book and also at Deputy Sheriff Bob Carey's wedding, but I didn't shoot any video there. And as always, I went out to the Pleasant Home Cemetery where I found Chuck at work. I think a lot of things have changed, especially area people are much more interested in the cemetery. Uh, I'm uh, going to be putting up a new fence uh, across the front and eventually around the whole cemetery. That particular cemetery story will always be richer and bigger and mm -hmm. more important than it ever was before. Chuck would come out once a year to try and cut back the growth, you know, of time in that place. And I don't think that's going to be a problem for a long time. Probably is a little hard to believe, but since we're Colorado Springs and been there so long that we wouldn't be coming back to Nebraska to be interred <laughs> in the Pleasant Home Cemetery, but that's what we're going to do. Each year that I come back, I come back to a very peaceful, serene place. And even though I'm working and what have you, it's just a pleasure to be there. Mm -hmm. The great big old cedars uh, seem to give you shelter both mentally and physically. The wonderful thing that the stone brought us together. Yes, it is. We really appreciate a lady by the name of Alexander Grant that kept that stone for 11 years and wanted to find a home for it, and she sure did. I sure did. <laughs>